Today is Monday, May 6, 2019. My name is Lauren Keating, and I am here with Sara Hornby in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the Association for Iron and Steel Technologies, AIS Tech 2019. Sara is the president and owner of Global Strategic Solutions, and she has been a prominent member of the iron and steel community for over 35 years. We are doing this capture for the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical, and Petroleum Engineers Oral History Program. Thank you, Sara, for agreeing to talk to us today and share your experience. Thank you for the opportunity. So, let's start at the beginning. Tell me about where you grew up. No fixed abode. Um, I had two army parents. Uh, my mother actually came out of the army when she was pregnant the first time. Um, so we were roaming family, including um, two. I've spent two years in Fort Rucker, Alabama, at, at uh, the seventh and eighth grade, age ten and eleven, and shipped home to boarding school because we weren't getting a good enough education. Um, from there, we went to South Yemen, and my father had in the uh, in the U.S. had been the British liaison officer to the helicopter training school here. And he was learning how to arm the British helicopters for the actual incidents that we had in, in South Yemen at the time. And for the last three years that we were, England was in Saudi Arabia, my father was in charge of the unit. And from there we went back to the UK and I was taken out of boarding school and lived at home for a, a year or so. Um, and then my parents were shipped to Yorkshire which is where my, my father had come from and wanted to be all his life. And I ended up at, um, at college in Sheffield, which is also Yorkshire. Um, so it was an interesting upbringing, very strict. I had more freedom at boarding school than I ever had at home. Um, but it was, it was a different childhood. And I've been roaming the, the world since. Yeah, it sounds like it's had a, mm -hmm. a large impact on what you've done since. Yeah. Uh, what did you choose to study at university? At university? Nothing like what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> when I was taken out of boarding school, um, the reason at the time was that I had wanted to do um, two maths and art as my A-level subjects. And I was at an all-girls boarding school, and they basically trained us to be young ladies. Um, very few sciences available. And I was given the opportunity to do just math, physics, and chemistry, which I took, and I did art as a side subject. Um, when my parents came back to England, they took me out of boarding school, and the excuse was I could do two maths and English, uh, two maths and art down at the school in in Wiltshire under a different exam board, which actually turned out not to be the case. And I went on strike. They had done what I had not done, and they had, were about to do what I'd already studied. And I just blew off the rest of my A-level exams, and um, I ended up with two A-levels and one OA-level pass, and an A-level English, which meant I actually couldn't go to university. But during the procedure of choosing to go to university, I had chosen cybernetics, uh, geology, uh, tribology, all sorts of weird subjects that weren't the norm partly in uh, rebellion to my father, who was, he had um, by then become the um, examiner for the intake for the British Army. And he had various suppliers come to talk to the students that were going through. And Rank Hovis McDougall at the time had said, they'd take me on as a, a new employee, but I had to get a degree, any degree but computing, and I could become a computing person. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. So... I uh, ended up failing, and the option then was not getting into university and looking for something else, go back to school for a year, which I was not going to do, um, or go to a polytechnic. And I'd never even considered that or heard of it. So I started talking to a career advisor about what was available, and it was the usual boring subjects, until we got to metallurgy, and he said, well, that's something you could do with the three subjects, but you're a woman and you can't do it. So guess what? <laughs> I did it.
Did you have any internships or other experiences that further encouraged you into the steel industry? I, um, I actually interviewed with two, you know, two polytechnics. One was at Lanchester. And after an eight-hour exam with them, they decided I couldn't go there because I was underage. And um, they had a co-op program, both of the colleges. They offered to put me through a year of, of training with the co-op, one of the co-op partners. Um, but I decided I probably would never go back to school if I started earning money and got freedom. So I went to Sheffield. They didn't mind how old I was, but they were a little bit concerned I'd be the only woman in, in the engineering school. Um, but that also was a co-op. And the first one was with a company called Joseph Lucas. And they had hydrogen cars running around in 1970. Um, and they, I went into the research group with seven women. And that was the last time I worked with a lot of women. <laughs> Um, and the second one was actually a year later, and it was six months at a, a cupola foundry with hot metal. And that's basically where I decided I wanted to be a melter. So what was your first professional job in the industry? It was, uh, well, apart from the two co-ops, I ended up uh, working for Applied Research Laboratories, which made spectrographic equipment, which I had used when I was doing the co-op in the cupola foundry. I was technically the European sales manager, but I spent most of my time making coffee for my boss. I was the only woman in the office. So it was, it was quite an interesting start to my career. So you've mentioned, uh, of course, at the time, being a woman was a rarity. <laughs> oh, yes. Were there other difficulties that you found as you transitioned into your career? Um, I was challenged from the minute I started at college. I was uh, two weeks late starting. And I remember the first day I walked into the lecture theater and it was a theater. And there were 24 men aged 18 through 24, 25. Um, and they all asked me what room I was looking for because this obviously wasn't the right one. And I <laughs> crept slowly to the back of the room to, to take my seat because it was the right room. Um, the whole college was pretty much uh, expecting me to fail. And it turned out they'd had one female student in the engineering department before me who had succumbed to pregnancy very early on and never finished the first year. And that, that was the expectation. Where did you find the confidence to continue to pursue uh, your passion that you found? I'm an Aries. <laughs> <laughs> Type A personality and, you know, I'm. That was basically, I was told by my mother growing up that there was nothing you couldn't do if you put your mind to it. So Excellent advice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, did you have any mentors at that stage? Uh, college, they, they really expected me to fail until I went through the two co-ops. So I was by then three years into my four-year degree program. I had a supervisor, obviously. He was a pretty good mentor, but he also told me how, taught me how to play bridge till four or five o'clock in the morning and go to sleep in class the next day. Um, but yeah, he was pretty good. And there was um, the professor that taught us welding. He thought it was a delight to have a woman in the room, um, spent most of his time with metallurgical jokes because of it. But he, he followed my career after I left and really promoted me when we went to steel mill or to foundry visits or to even to the copper companies. He would make a special attempt to, to show me what was going on and, and feel out where I was interested. As you began in the profession, what was your first major project like? I uh, still related. It was uh, heat tinting. I developed a heat tinting process for the quality control of uh, high-speed steel and tungsten carbide tips for the high-speed steel, which was kind of a... I was always accused of being an artist throughout my metallurgy course. <laughs> and I got to play artist. Your PhD is in industrial metallurgy from Hallam University, uh, Sheffield City Polytechnic, United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to pursue a PhD? 
I didn't to start with. When I finished my degree, they offered me the opportunity to do a PhD immediately, even though I hadn't really excelled in my grades. But again, I'd been part of the METSOC and part of the student union and partied my way through my four years. Um, and at the time, the only PhD subjects they had were um, what I would call lab related. I mean, they were truly genuine research and I wasn't interested. I wanted to do something that was um, industrially related. So I went into industry and two years later, British Steel Corporation was having problems with their ingot molds. They were failing rapidly and they wanted to sponsor a PhD. So they came to me and said, would I be interested? And they had just the year before started the industrial metallurgy course, which comprised two and a half years, part time, one, one day a week, 12 hours a day doing a master's course. And that included uh, advanced metallurgy and MBA and a case study on your related PhD. So I analyzed the problems of British Steel Corporation. Um, at the same time, we did our PhD research. So it was, it was kind of an interesting, <laughs> it was an interesting three years. Absolutely. And I was actually hired as a lecturer. I wasn't a PhD student. I was a lecturer one. So I got to teach some of the students as well. Sounds very challenging. No, it was interesting. It was fun. All culminated, the masters culminated with an eight and a half hour exam that took me from the bottom of the class to the top of the class. And all the staff were like, you know, you, we knew you had it in you, but you know, you finally showed us. It was like, well, it was time <laughs> to prove a point. Sorry, I noticed that you have a Lean Six Sigma black belt. Tell us about that. Yes, I, um, a couple of reasons I took it. When I was, I, I told you earlier that when I was um, doing my PhD, my, well, my master's program, um, the eight and a half hour exam at the end, I pulled myself up to a top of the class and surprised everybody. That was actually, um, I, I had taken quality control as one of my three advanced courses for the exam and chosen to take that as a subject and wrote a quality control manual in eight and a half hours for a foundry. That was called quality control then, but of course now the, the big buzzword is the black belt Six Sigma. When um, I had the opportunity a few years ago, I went and commuted my quality control into the black belt Six Sigma to be current. The other reason was I thought I could use it as a, an additional piece to my consulting business and I could go outside the industry and look around, but people don't want that, <laughs> I found out, but that's fine. So. so tell us about your career progression in Europe and then transitioning to North America. Um, well, the PhD was sponsored by British Steel Corporation, so they expected me to go to work for them, and as I did. Um, they at the time had a um, man young managers program where you learned every part of the steel industry from start from scrapyard through or from even through the blast furnaces and BOFs. In our plant, it was an electric arc furnace. Um, because I had a PhD, I was sidestepped to do special projects for the, for the plant manager. Um, and then there was a melt shop job that came up and I applied for it and I was told very nicely that I was the most qualified person for it, but there was no way a woman was going into the melt shop in those days. So I ended up um, as a hot strip development metallurgist rolling high strength Soala steels for Ford Motor Company. Um, with the obvious commentary of being a hot strip metallurgist. But that was fun too at the time. And they challenged me unbelievably throughout the time I was doing that work. My husband then applied, by then I had married, um, and my husband had applied for a job in Montreal and went to work for uh, what was then um, Quebec Ferre Titan, which is now Rio Tinto. So we moved to Montreal. Um, I was offered a job with, with Quebec uh, Iron Entertainium and with Sidbeck Dosco with the condition that I would learn French in two years. I mean, I spoke French, but not Quebecois. That was a problem. Uh, 
uh, so I joined Early Kid um, and traveled the world as my husband was going to do with QIT. So from there, let's see, I spent 17 years with Early Kid, um, Quebec, I went to Chicago, and I went to San Francisco to the head office, well, actually Walnut Creek. And then they asked me to, to move again, either to the new corporate office in Houston or back to the tech center in Chicago, or preferably to the job in Toronto that they'd created under my um, request, which, which was uh, combining the management of not only the marketing, but the um, research and the applications groups to make sure that they were all in tune and communicating properly. Um, it was easier to facilitate the actual applications to the customers. So we were discussing your career progression and you began to talk about off-gas analysis, Early Kid. Yes, Early Kid, um, we had an off-gas analysis um, application that was called LRC PC. Um, it combined post-combustion and the analysis of off-gas. Um, but we were very much interested in the use of gases, obviously, and we weren't doing such a good job with the computer side of things. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, Goodfellow Consultants and had split into Goodfellow Technologies with an off-gas analysis system, and they were computing engineers and capable of doing analysis, um, but didn't know much about steel industry. Um, they had done a lot of off-gas analysis for um, other industrial plants, but nothing like a steel mill. So we started talking about a joint venture which was not acceptable to Early Kid France. Um, and ultimately, Howard Goodfellow came to me and said, would you like to come and play director of technology and teach us how to deal with the steel industry? He had already got a, an agreement with Coastal Alaska um, to do the first demonstration, but uh, I was asked to come and help them commute their um, basically consulting to technical sales and manage the group and and help them learn about steel making. And it was quite a fun two years. Ended up doing a lot of work in England, funnily enough, with um, one of the old people from British Steel Corporation was running Co-Steel Lasco's plant at Sheerness. So we, we put an installation, actually two installations in there. And then they asked me to consult to tell them why they weren't making the money they should have been. So it was fun. Um, so from Goodfellow, um, there was a problem with Howard's family, so he sold the business. By then I was um, the director of technology and, and operations. He had gone to teach at uh, University of Toronto um, and taken a sabbatical. Uh, but the new owners had asked him to come back in as part of the agreement, so I was downsized. Um, and at the time I was about to have my first litter of kittens. <laughs> And then Midrex came looking for me to, to move down to Charlotte um, to be the product program manager for Melting, um, which I finally did. Uh, and I was there for a couple of years working on... Our mandate in that group was to look for new technologies that could use the basis of um, Midrex's core business for the DRI plants and find some way to use it in other industries. Um, but I also found out that <clears throat> their DRI plants, um, there was a misconnect or disconnect between the DRI plants and what they were doing and making and the actual EAF steelmakers in general who were using the DRI. And I was a proponent, having had some major experiences with, with early kid, of having high carbon contained in material, whether it's pig iron or DRI. So I started to do a lot of the training for um, the DRI plants and what their product would do to an EAF and the EAFs on the restrictions that there were from the DRI plants. So that became a, a teaching scenario as well as trying to build business for the DRI worldwide. Um, let's see, from Midrex, we had those two big, big downturns in the steel industry. And I was downsized, so I decided I would start my own business, which is the one I'm currently running. Um, and I continued to consult to the industry until, uh, let me see, Lindy Gasses came calling and asked me to join them. They had put a division together here 
to look at the German research and see whether or not it was applicable in North America. So I got involved again in a new off-gas analysis system for the electric arc furnaces, which was laser-based. Um, and I spent most of my time with them uh, doing that project. There were a couple of other minor projects like melt welding uh, cast iron to steel, which hadn't been done before, which was interesting too. They were then um, bought, finally bought BOC up in Newark, New Jersey. And everything moved from Cleveland to Newark, New Jersey. So some of us were left behind. Uh, I went back to consulting. Um, and the next position I had was with um, Process Technology International. They're now in Teco. We had worked together on a potential laser off-gas analysis system, and they asked me to come and be the um, vice president of sales and marketing for their combustion-based equipment, injection equipment. We had, had another downturn, so I went back to working for myself. Um, I did some consulting for Nucor along the way and Gallatin Steel. Um, and I ended up working for, actually I interviewed and got two offers the same day. One was for SSI in England, back in the frozen cold wastes of the Northeast um, at the plant that was being restarted that had been shut down by British Steel or shut down when British Steel demised. Um, and, the, and Tube City IMS here in Indiana. Um, and I took the job in Indiana. The weather was better. <laughs> so for the third time, I was supposed to move out of Charlotte, go to Indiana, but I was left where I was. And I uh, managed the optimization group for Tube City IMS. Um, so we were optimizing charges to electric arc furnaces or to BOFs to produce low cost steel. When that job finished in 2013, I went back full time to my own consulting business. I've been doing that since. Uh, you've done some travel to European metallurgical plants. Yes, my um, my first trip was um, I w we had some German um, HR people from steel mills into the polytechnic where I was at the time um, on a training course. And we, they actually stayed in our hall of residence. We only had one. They talked to me about the industry in Germany. And um, as it turned out, I won the second year um, student award and was given funds to go do what I wanted to look at something metallurgical wherever. And the Germans were still in town, and they helped me plan a three-week trip around Germany to see uh, oh, Duisburg, Kupferhütte, a couple of the steel mills, the integrated steel mills. Oh, there was a forging plant who remembered the war and said, oh, we've got a Brit in the place, you know. Uh, you won the war, and we're supposed to, you know, show you all our secrets. But it was a, it was a great experience. I got to see a whole different side of the industry from what I'd seen in, in England. And then, of course, I revisited a lot of the steel mills as I went through my early kid roles because I used to take customers, Canada or, or US customers or potential customers to Europe to see all the different technologies. I think the craziest trip was we did 14 steel mills, 12 countries in 10 days. It was awful. And one of the vice president of Slater Steel's suitcase was on the ground. 10 minutes after we got in the air, they said, sorry, sir. And because of our schedule, it caught up with us over a week later, including bomb squads to <laughs> pull a strange suitcase out of someone's bathtub where we put it when well, this suitcase showed up. Yeah, no, it's been very interesting. So we did Luxembourg, we did Germany, France, Belgium, all the way around Spain, top, north of Spain over the years. And we looked at the, the new technologies, the DC furnaces that were coming out of Europe, um, the oxyfer burner technology, the, the bottom stirring. I mean, all those technologies were ahead of the time and some cases still are in Europe. And we took people to see the new technologies. So as a follow up, I have a non-technical question <laughs> and a technical question okay. for you. <laughs> You've traveled and you've lived in so many different locations. 
I'm sure what a great opportunity in some senses and probably some challenges in others. Is there a location or a facility that stands out to you as perhaps your favorite or a particular experience that was your stands out as a favorite? Steel mill, country, or actual town, or all three? All, all of the above. I found, as, as an adult, I found um, San Francisco to be the most conducive to a single female. They were so accepting of anybody and everybody that moved into the area. Um, Chicago, there were cliques everywhere, even though I knew the people I worked with for five and a half years. I was a single woman and a threat to everybody and the wives, and wives more especially. And it was crazy. I mean, it, uh, plant wise, oh gosh, that's, they're all so different. I mean, I've been from Asia through to all over most of Europe. Um, I don't know. I guess the, the smallest furnace I worked on in the steel industry, not the foundry, was Western Canada Steel, who originally had, now there's a good mentor, they originally had a 20 ton electric arc furnace sunk in the floor. And they wanted to put oxyfuel burners and they were actually my, our early kids first installation of oxyfuel burners in North America. I was in the hospital at the time they installed them, unfortunately. Um, that's another, another story. The, um, the boss said, if you're going to give me burners, I want the biggest ones you've got. And he put three six megawatt burners into this 20 ton furnace. And when they pushed the button, they set the whole thing on fire. <laughs> There's pictures of flames pouring out of this furnace. But we, we actually put smaller ones in in the end. But yeah, that was, that was, the, that was the smallest one I worked on. But, uh, favorite? So, I don't know. The scariest one I worked on, and I've done some crazy things in my life, which would have got me terminated by everybody that's around now, um, was Sid uh, Sydney Steel in Nova Scotia. I had worked for British Steel, and they had lots of open hearth furnaces, but I'd never seen one. And I went there, and we were running ingot mold trials. We were purging the ingot molds, and they were tapping... We were tapping the, the open house into ladles, and I think the ladles were 250 tons. Well, the first thing they did was at 2 o'clock in the morning, they put me in the, in the crane while they blasted open, and I mean blasted with dynamite, the tap hole. First problem. Second one was they asked me if I'd like to tap the ladle while we were shrouding the ingot molds, and I had to stand with 250 tons of liquid steel over my head, and he said, if it starts to leak, push it that way and run that way. <laughs> yeah, it was, and it was, I think it was something like minus 20 degrees in the middle of December. It was not fun, but it was fun. And the only place to keep warm was the men's washroom. And still is in most plants. What are some of the biggest technical challenges you've had? You want some funny ones? I'm Absolutely. Serious. I got very frustrated with the steel industry at one point. And having come out of the foundry industry, I decided to redirect our efforts of my team to the foundry industry. We had put um, liquid shrouding on continuous casters. It hadn't been very successful, not very many people, especially in North America. I think Coastal Alaska was the only person that did it here for a while. And I couldn't understand why we couldn't take that into the foundries and melt under liquid. So we did. Well, we started calling on all the foundries from here to LA. <clears throat> and one day after a very frustrating three or four days in LA with the traffic and negative foundrymen, we came across a German running a foundry. And he said, if your process is dot, dot, that good, be back here at eight o'clock tonight. And I said, done. We'll be here. We had no foundry gear, no boots. We had no equipment. We haven't even thought that far ahead. But we raided, well, Eric kid knows about it now. We raided the hospital truck and took the diffusers off the hospital truck and the pipes and the lines and the tanks and 
we put the equipment together and we bought saucepans and we graduated them so that we could use them to pour into the molds. And we graduated soup scoops and we went in with our, I think it was liquid nitrogen to that. And they were making copper beryllium heats. And we, they would, it was very archaic. They would melt the copper with some beryllium in the furnace and then they would tap it into a ladle and tap it back into the furnace. And we had these, we had these lances with liquid dripping out of them through these diffusers, which didn't last very long because they weren't very high grade metal. We had to put SO, uh, the steel pads, the, the steel wool on the end in the end. So we, I was following this furnace and the tapping and the furnace and the tapping. I had muscles the next day I didn't know I'd ever had before. But they all worked with us. And we poured liquid into the, into the molds and we tapped into that as well. And all of the little Mexicans were running around saying, can we have a scoop? And they were, they were following us. And we saved them $6,500 each heat. And the guy said, put a full installation in the next day. I mean, it was crazy, but we, had, we hadn't got anything ready. And the, the local applications manager got me outside and said, you did what? <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Find a solution. I just got you the contract. <laughs> so yeah, that was probably the biggest challenge. So a similar question, a little bit of a different twist on it. You've had a wide array of achievements throughout your career, various facilities, various operations. Which stand out as the achievements that you're most proud of? I don't think there's any single one. That, that process was named the SPAL process, Surface Protection Early Kid, or it got nicknamed SARS process for argon liquidation. That is still running today. Gosh, no, I don't know how many years later, I don't know how many customers anymore. I think there were quite a lot. And it went from um, the gas-fired furnaces making copper right the way through to all of the, the high-quality um, investment castings for the medical industry. So, you know, it was, and it was fun doing it. I mean, it became such a success at Airly Kid. They gave me a team, I think, of 15 people who ran and knocked on every door in the country so we, so we could get a head start on all the other gas companies before they started to find out what we were doing. And we gave papers. And we never told them we were using liquid. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a fun time. But we've done something similar with CO2. We um, took an idea from Japan, and hence the first trial with that was Evaco. I stood and shoveled 250 pounds of CO2 pellets about the size of my thumb into a ladle, and um, it was a front-tapping furnace, and we tapped the hot metal onto the CO2, and Everybody was expecting it to explode, and I was the only one out on the plant floor above the ladle with my toes crossed in my boots praying. I was right, it wasn't going to explode. But yeah, I mean, the, the plants have done a tremendous job over the years in helping me do what I call applied research and development. Once they began to trust my crazy ideas, they were more than willing to help out. Charter Electric in Chicago when they existed, they were right down the road from our tech center. And we'd say, we've got a crazy idea. Can we come down and try it? And we took the spile process into the steel mill there and we put it in the ladle furnace to stop the, the problem with hydrogen and nitrogen pickup. It was too expensive to use in the steel mill, but it worked. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So you've worked with so many industry leaders. Who has had a profound impact on your career? I think since I've joined the AIST, a lot of the leaders of AIST and AIME were, um, were big mentors. Um, there's a, I started to go through a potential list of people who had mentored me, and there's so many, it's just impossible. But um, one of the people that's sticks out as Grant Schneider. He was president of AIST, or ISS then, and the AIME. Um, he had a daughter that was doing an unusual career, and he 
try to persuade me to continue to, to beat down the doors. He also used to drag me aside at cocktail parties and say, come with me, come with me, come and tell the ladies, but don't tell them any of the crazy stories, you know, but come and try and persuade them this is a great industry to be in. So he got me involved with the students. So I was on the, the, um, the industry university committee at one point with the ISS. Um, Keith Brimacom, and I knew him as in part because he was at one point an early kid um, professor as well as Alex McLean and uh, Gord Irons. They all worked as consultants for us, so I had, had them as mentors, especially Alex when I was up in, in Canada. Um, I think when I joined AIST, Norm Mills, I believe, was he was he turned out to be a good friend too, and he was a competitor of mine for a while when he was with the other gas company. So yeah, but there's been a lot of people. I hate to there's so many. I don't want to don't want to cut anybody out and upset anybody. But yeah. You've been awarded five patents. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about how your research and development efforts led to those achievements? That was the spa process <laughs> in the foundry in LA. Um, we, we actually got a patent for the equipment we finally developed. Um, we, got a, equip, we got a patent for the process, which they said we couldn't really do, but we did. Um, we took it on to um, the copper furnaces, the vertical copper furnaces, so that when they had to shut down, we could flood it with liquid and it would save them losing all the copper. Um, huge savings. Um, the ladle furnace, of course. Um, I'm trying to think what the fifth one was. It was also liquid use. And since then, there's been more that have been taken by other people at Air Liquid for uh, titanium melting. And yeah, it's, it's still going on. Can you describe how your passion for metallurgy and melting grew and developed as your career progressed? I think passion was always there. The ability to follow it wasn't. Um, with the exposure that I got within the AIST and the mentors that were well-known names in the industry, people began to trust me and they would allow me to come play in their plants. Um, some were very successful. Others were a little bit challenging. I had one incident in, um, I think it was Nova Scotia. I was sent out, to, it wasn't a steel mill, it was a foundry, but it's similar to the direct wear injection in a, in, a, in a blast furnace. And I'd been trained by this French technician and I was sent out to install the direct wear injection of the cupola foundry and things started to go wrong and I told them how to turn their cupola around. <laughs> And they flat out refused to do it until I got my French technician to fly from Paris, who told them exactly the same thing. And he was a very brusque elderly gentleman. And he told them that he taught me, I knew what I was doing and they damn well follow my instructions the next time he wasn't coming back. <laughs> but it, yeah, it was challenging throughout the whole career, but the passion was still there. I love to be around molten metal. I did not like the heat treatment. I was in charge of that and welding for a while, but they used to joke about me and my passion for pyromania, basically. It's obvious when you talk about metallurgy and you talk about melting, you light up. <laughs> so it's your passion is obvious there. What other passions do you have? Animals. Can you tell us about that? Oh. I think the highlight of my life was when I was allowed into a, an enclosure with three 18-month-old cheetahs in South Africa when I was on a business-slash-Christmas trip with a friend from the industry. Um, I was asked by Midrex to commute a week of the vacation to go down to South Af to, to the Cape area and go visit some steel mills and uh, the Macwa Sands and Iron Sands company that might be able to use some of the Midrex technology. But when we got back to uh, her parents' home, they asked me if I wanted to go on a safari and see lions. And I said, not really, I'd like to go see cheetahs. And we looked it up and it turned out there was a cheetah, the Wilt Cheetah Preservation, about 45 minutes away. And they took in cheetahs that had been uh, hurt by the farmers because they were poaching. 
or had been found abandoned. And they were in charge basically of the breeding program for most of the world. And they had anything from six, eight week old cubs at the front you could pet on the way through to these cheetahs that they had that they were taking out to, to industry and to the locals and to the farmers and on a leash like a dog and showing them how friendly they were. And how and, and in teaching them how they should live together with these animals and that they were dwindling in, in the wild. And throughout the whole of the, the safari through seeing the wild dogs, I kept saying, can we go and see the pussy cats? Because I love cats too. They finally, after I bought out half the shop to take home presents to England, they let me into this enclosure with the three cheetahs, and it was yeah, they were incredible. They were like overgrown, overgrown house cats, but they were much bigger and could do a lot more damage, but they were as sweet as they came and they purred and they, um, they just wanted attention. Then the friend came inside the enclosure, but she wasn't very keen on animals. And um, one of them took exception and actually kind of nudged her and bit her slightly to say, please, I need some attention too. But yeah, that was fun. Do you have any animals at home? Mm, people would tell you too many. I'm the crazy cat lady. I have uh, five Siamese cats now. I uh, just lost the sixth one to cancer. Um, I have a blue point, two lilac points, a chocolate point, and a seal lynx point. Four of them are bred in house. And I also have 14 raccoons, three possums, and several deer running around the back garden, uh, well, as, along with the birds. So a very lively residence. Oh yeah. <laughs> Neighbors don't know. I have actually the, the gardener came out the other day and wanted to know what the track was, what what small dog I had in the house, and I said none. He said, well, you've got a track through the, the grass in the garden. I said, yeah, it's the raccoon track. There's another one over here. <laughs> Somehow in your free time, which I really can't imagine how you have any. <laughs> But you, uh, you've taken on some volunteer work. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I um, became a volunteer for Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department um, after a very extensive questionnaire and background check. And I um, have honed in on the, I'm certified for the whole of the police department, but my preference is to work with the animals, so animal care and control. Uh, unfortunately, I am now allergic to cats and dogs over the last two or three years. Um, so I tend to make follow-up phone calls to adoptive parents to make sure that they understand their responsibilities and they understand any problems they've had with the, with the, with the animals, cats or dogs, um, and help them any way I can. Tell them they can get, take their food back to PetSmart and get their money back and generally help settle the, the, the animals. There's a lot of abandoned animals in the Charlotte area. I think everywhere, but I've seen a lot in the Charlotte area. It's, it's really despicable and dogs for fighting. So we take them in and try. Big, big program for us now is to not be as big a kill self shelter as we have been in the past. So, and it's working. So I add that to my raccoons that I can hand feed and pick up. <laughs> You've accumulated a tremendous portfolio of technical papers and presentations, as well as many seminars. How has lecturing and teaching enriched your experience in the industry? When I started with the industry, I guess I had the uh, understanding, expectation, maybe it was my mother's expectation that I would be a career woman, a wife, a mother. And I thought the way I could do that ultimately would be to end up in university teaching. Um, I only got one out of the three. But I, I enjoy passing on the knowledge and the experience and sharing the stories. And in today's world, much of what I've done probably couldn't be done. It would be unsafe. It would be challenging. Um, and there's not many crazy people around either. 
internal to the companies that I've worked for, I've um, in some instances had to train them in the steel industry because they had no knowledge. So that's been a great way to uh, pass on my experience to, to others. Um, internal to companies that dealt with the steel industry, it's been more a question of, of um, persuading them that the industry needs new technology, innovation, and how we might be able to, to assist them. And I must admit, when I haven't been given the go-ahead, I've gone without permission and asked for it later and done some things. Um, I've also been down in South America. I was because of Keith Brimacom. Um, they invited me down to do a three week, three day seminar on industrial gases and steel making because no one was really talking about um, that down there in terms of the the immense possibilities that there were because steel mills weren't using them all. So I got to go down and talk about bottom stirring of furnaces and the obvious oxyfil burners and the oxygen injection. But we talked about the CO2 um, opportunities of replacing argon with CO2 and saving millions. And so all of the crazy things we had done tested, AOD replacement of argon, um, we've done it. Some of them, the CO2 and the AOD, that became a success where Praxair had failed because we actually happened to preheat the gas by accident before it hit the furnace. <laughs> An hour's work. Um, and we got, that's the other patent. We got a patent on replacing argon with CO2 in the AOD. I've read a quote from you that I find particularly interesting. You said, North American producers need to find ways to reduce their costs further, perhaps even revisiting old technologies to do so. Like fashion, what goes around comes around. Perhaps it's time to revisit them. Can you tell me your thoughts on that? Um, that arose from a conference where I was chairing sessions, I think, for the, for the AIST three years ago, I think it was. There were a, a lot of questions from the floor on uh, maybe we could do this and maybe we could do that and why hasn't someone thought of and I sat there biting my tongue thinking, we were selling you guys this kind of stuff 30 years ago and you wouldn't use it. And it just, you know, maybe it's time that the technologies we were offering then, we brought um, off gas stirring of the furnaces to the country. I mean, all of us, all the gas companies and some of the ceramic companies. People here didn't want to do it because it, I'm trying to be, positive here. It was uh, labor intensive, they thought. Um, there was an issue with some of the systems with lead falling out of the bottom of the furnace, which was obviously dangerous. But they would put it in for a week and say, doesn't work, and walk away. The off-gas analysis systems were put in, and they had to send someone to clean out the systems once a week. And gee, that was another person's time. It was only like a third of a person's day once a month, you know? I mean, it was frustrating, which is why I went to the founders. But there's so many of those types of CO2 replacement of argon. If the sources of CO2 and we want to get rid of the CO and the CO2 that's out there, why don't we use it? So maybe it's time to start looking again. When did you first hear about AIME and its member society, the Iron and Steel Society? Um, I guess my main mentor, early kid originally, in terms of the Iron and Steel Society was Bob Lee. Um, the people that I worked with and around in Canada didn't really come to the ISS. Um, so he interested me and I started coming and I, um, I believe I joined back in 1982, was it five? Um, and as I said at the time, Norm Mills was, I believe, president of both at the time. So I got an overview of both. And again, with Grant Schneider, I remember going to a black tie dinner with Grant Schneider and his wife. That was, uh, that was one of the first ones I went to with AIME. 
how did your involvement progress over the years, including up until now with the new association, AIST, which was formed from ISS in the AISE merger mm -hmm. in 2004? Um, when I joined the ISS, um, I was persuaded, I think it was Keith Brimacom persuaded me to join the process technology division. Um, so I joined that committee. I helped to organize a joint, uh, joint, we organized a um, AOD conference basically. Um, then I got involved in through the chairs, the process technology and my predecessor as chair <clears throat> had to with, withdraw from his chairing. So I ended up taking over earlier and was on the board therefore for three years. I with um, Ruth Engels were the first two women on the board. We even shook that up a little bit. And I'm pretty sure no one wants to hear the story I have to tell about that. <laughs> well, I think you do. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> maybe we'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I went through the chairs through the PTE. Um, we had a major conversation when I became chair, whether we should be chairman or woman. And I said, no, 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 we're not changing it. So I was still the chairman. The um, once on the board, I was on the board with, uh, let's see, Harry Falwell and Keith were the presidents at that time. And um, Keith asked me to head up the ad hoc committee from the board on international affairs, because down in about 1995, we'd started talking to Argentina about joining the ISS. And actually, while I was down there at one of the conferences, the um, head of the IAS, the Instituto Argentina, they asked me to sign the document that brought them into the ISS. And whilst I had no signing power, I was not an officer. They said they didn't care. They just wanted a big hoo-ha to say that we are now part of the ISS. So that's why I was asked to get involved with the International Ad Hoc Committee to see where we were going and what direction. Um, since the merger, um, I have been on, oh, I was on the, um, I think I said earlier, the uh, student liaison, student industry, university industry committee. And there was another one I was on, can't remember. Um, and joining the AIST, I came in on the iron making side because I was uh, more involved in the iron making at that point in time. And I've now transitioned back to the electric furnace and the DRI committee. In 2002, you were the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award for at that time, 19 years of distinguished and tireless service to the Iron and Steel Society and its many division committees and boards. Please tell us why you received this recognition and what it meant to you. I, I think it was an endeavor by, by the powers that be to recognize the effort that I put in. I mean, I enjoyed working with them and working with the society and trying to promote it. Um, I was very honored to get it. It was a complete surprise. I mean, I, I had no idea it was coming. They just announced it in front of me at one of this. Yeah, it was, it was really, it, I guess it, it in part made me feel as though my challenges over the years had been recognized. Because I don't think any of the men in the industry, and I'm not a, I'm not a woman, I'm not banging the, the drum for women. Um, I chose the profession. I prefer to work with men. Um, but every day has been a fight, basically. And to a large extent, it still continues to be. And I am perceived as arrogant, pushy, whatever you want to say, because I will stand up and argue. But that also is a negative for women in the industry because we're supposed to be demure little silent people on the side, and that's not who I am, I never was. But the, um, I don't think the men have any understanding, and the few that do, I think, were, were partly wanting to recognize that. 
you've been a leader in many different capacities uh, in the mm. ISS and AIME. How has that benefited your career? Well, I, I think the um, it's obviously marketed me and my talents and the companies for whom I've worked. I mean, it's been invaluable. It's given me uh, exposure that I wouldn't have had any other way. It's given me the networking capabilities. I mean, I can pick up the phone or get on Skype with people around the world and ask questions because of my association with both societies. How do you see societies benefiting people in the industry today? I think the same way. I think, um, I think the societies are imperative in their lives if they can get sponsorship from their companies the the bonding of their own peer group and the ability to learn from mentors within the industry is is invaluable and, and i think today the societies in general are making making a move to make that happen and to bring more people in at the lower level and make sure that they're part of the society. So they grow through the society and they are therefore learning from we baby boomers are about to disappear. Um, it, it's going to be invaluable. In your opinion, what can we do to attract young people to the industry? I'm a firm believer that we could capitalize on we baby boomers who are semi-retired, retired, or generally thinking about it. Um, you know, we could be used to go even down to the, to the school levels, below the universities. I think we need to start there. And someone brought up, in fact, it was Harriet Dutka, at the uh, Women in Steel meeting yesterday, suggested that we needed to take the parents out and show them what the steel industry was like and to rebrand the steel industry and show them that, yes, it's still a dirty industry and you need to be... There was a comment on the, um, the AIST just published the results of the survey. And they published one gentleman saying, oh, I don't have men telling me I've broken a fingernail or got my hands dirty. I mean. We need to instruct people that if they want to get into this industry, it is dirty. You are going to get fingernails broken. I mean, I, I've dealt with these and done trials in steel mills and not broken one, so it's possible. But we need to educate. We need to educate not only the steel mills down on what the youngsters need who are coming into the industry, and we also need to, to, to educate the parents and the children of the potentials across all of the diverse applications, you know, whether it's engineering or, you know, hey, nursing facilities in the future. I mean, it's going to have everything. I had a student across me tonight and say, you're trying to bring new people into the industry. Let me tell you two reasons we can't. The first one is the salaries suck. And the second one is <laughs> the steel mills are in the middle of nowhere. And I'm a young kid and I want to enjoy my life. So can we put some steel mills somewhere near a big town, please? I mean, he was serious. He said, that's why we're not coming into it. He was doing his PhD, but he doesn't think he's going into the industry because of those reasons. It's sad. So the, the AIST and all of the societies are addressing the problems, but the steel mills have got to do a good job too, of making it competitive and, and rebranding themselves. You've certainly been a pioneer as a woman in the industry. What are your thoughts on being a role model for other women? And do you have any advice specifically for young women in the industry? Uh, I hope I've been a role model. Um, Perhaps not in today's society where risks are not really a good thing. <laughs> um, I think we've become, I mean, we've become more safe. When I look back at what I've done in my career, I shudder and think I could have been dead times over if things had gone wrong. Um, and we do need safety. We need safety first. Don't get me wrong. Um, 
but I think I think women need to understand that if they got a passion, they should follow it and they should mm -hmm. not let people say you can't do it. They should not let people push aside their, their visions. Um, and they should orient themselves to getting good mentors in the business who can teach them and show them how. Now, I am a type one personality. I, I will fight back. I have friends in the industry who are more feminine and they, I will respond. You give me a trial, I'll show you I can do it. They don't and they still succeed. So there's different ways of doing it. And I think talking to the different types of women in the industry would be good because we can show you how we've ch taken the challenges on and, and surmounted them, but not everyone's the same. And I think they need to understand that. But I think the men too have got to change their attitude, even today. I hear so many people saying, we need women in the industry, but they are, talking out of one and mm -hmm. the statistics show that I think 50 something percent want women in the industry, but I would challenge that. I know it's a difficult question, but I have to ask you, what has been your favorite part of working in the industry? Oh gosh. I mean, there's not just one thing, I don't think. I've liked the challenge. I've liked the learning. I love the people. We're a crazy industry. We're a specific type. Um, it is dirty. But I mean, eh. there, it's, there's so many challenges. And each plant is different. Each furnace in a plant is different. Uh, you can work on two furnaces and get two totally different results. I mean, it, it's a constant challenge, I think, in the industry. Constant challenge. What advice do you have for today's young leaders in the industry? Back to mentoring. I think um, they need to have the mentors. They need to have <clears throat> open discussions with their own peer group and their, the hierarchy and the way to do that is through the societies. I mean, the, the, the student population that seems to be here this time is, is phenomenal. It's much bigger than normal. And I think that's great. But whether we can retain the students and put them into the industry, the steel mills are doing a good job because they're taking on summer students or co-op students, whatever you want to call them. Um, and they're getting a taste of it whilst they're still doing their studies. But I, I haven't seen any statistics on how many of the co-ops that are actually working in the plants are retained in the plants. That would be a good statistic to have. But I think that's great. I mean, I would have never survived, enjoyed a university life. I way preferred going into a four degrees, four year degree course with two co-ops because I got to see the research and I hated it. I, I mean, it was all I could do back to go back and do my PhD because I really don't like the minutia. I like the big picture. Let's do something crazy. Let's prove it works and get someone else to figure out why the patent is going to work and how it, I mean, I, I just don't want to know. Give me the big picture. So yeah, it's, um, Is there anything else that you'd like to discuss? No, I mean, I just really like to, to thank everyone in the industry. I mean, I've had incredible support from customers, potential customers, you know, mentors. They've, they've made my career for me because they've helped me do the crazy things I've wanted to. I mean, <laughs> most of, even though I was in charge of an R&D department, they spent most of their time doing the non-ferrous stuff that was boring, water treatment and but we went to the plants and they allowed us to do the crazy AR&D stuff with them and, and find new ways to keep their costs down. Or we had a <laughs> use CO2 cannons that were used in the food industry. We took them to a steel mill and stuck it through the door of an electric arc furnace and we blew CO2 snow in there. Every time they dropped 
carbon into the furnace and had flames because the union was complaining about the environment. And they ended up using it until they put the new furnace in with a good off gas system. And we had Bethlehem Steel. They weren't allowed to cut their slag buttons by the EPA because there were too many red fumes going across. And uh, we put CO2 in their torches and stopped the problem. But they let us come out and play. So it's been a great life. And yeah, it's all been facilitated by by the companies I've worked for and the industry that I've served. Sarah, what a pleasure it has been to spend this time with you today. You've had a fascinating career and you certainly have served as a pioneer and a role model for the next generation of industry leaders. Thank you so much for your willingness to share your story with AIME. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope, uh, I hope it will inspire the new generation. And I'm always willing to, you know, I'm at the end of the phone if anyone wants to talk. So thank you. <laughs>